In the spring of 1943, on the territory of Western Ukraine, isolated armed groups united with the Ukrainian insurgent army. As a result of rebel fighting, entire areas were beyond the control of the Nazis. Rural, city, district, regional councils and departments began to operate in liberated territories. At that time, there was no single supreme civil authority to which local authorities were subordinated. There was also a need to represent the Ukrainian independence movement on the international stage. In the summer of 1944, the first large meeting with the participation of various Ukrainian political organizations, which formed the Interim Parliament of Ukraine, the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council, took place in the Lviv region. The former leader of the Ukrainian Central Rada, Kirill Osmak, was elected its head. The Ukrainian independence movement has always set itself the task of restoring a united Ukrainian state. Attempts to proclaim the relevant act of independence on June 30, 1941, in Lviv at the beginning of the German-Soviet war, were defeated. That's because these actions by the Ukrainian liberation movement contradicted the colonial interests of the Third Reich in the East. The Nazis repressed many members of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists also known as OUN, and their leaders were thrown into the Sachsenhausen concentration camp. The Ukrainian National Underground's armed struggle against the Nazi occupiers began in 1943. Their army was called an insurgent one because its commanders hoped that during the military confrontation the war in states could be exhausted. And then, at the right time, it would be possible to spark a national uprising and gain independence for Ukraine. They realized that a national uprising was impossible without preparing for it as a partisan war. The partisan war should be an overture to a general national uprising. When the Ukrainian insurgent army's military struggle became widespread, the underground of the OUN decided to legitimize its actions in internal politics and externally to find support on the international arena. For this, it was necessary to create a non-partisan, important representative body of war in Ukraine, so that it would on the one hand unite all Ukrainian political forces interested in creating an independent Ukraine, and on the other hand, could adequately represent the interests of the Ukrainian liberation movement in the world. At the same time, it was necessary to consolidate control over the areas liberated from the Nazis with the new government. To do this, it was necessary to create a wider socio-political base for the armed struggle in the future against the Nazis and Bolsheviks and to attract respected leaders of other political parties who supported the independence movement. At some point, the Ukrainian liberation movement stopped being a separate part of a certain nationalist movement. Therefore, Stepan Bandera's wing of OUN had to take into consideration the people and their wishes. So the creation of the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council showed that Ukrainian nationalism and the Ukrainian liberation movement ceased to be a doctrine imposed on the people from above. It was the movement of people who supported the fight to have a Ukrainian state. The need to enlist other national patriotic forces in the joint struggle and to be closer to the interests of the people forced the organization of Ukrainian nationalists to abandon the concept of integral nationalism in 1943, which envisaged the leader with unlimited power, a one-party system and lack of democracy. It was then that totalitarian statements about the Ukrainian nation were changed into the humanist slogan «Freedom to the peoples, freedom to people».
Ми знаємо, що український визвольний рух опирався виключно на підтримку України. Було пробовано на specific program was developed at the third great assembly of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists in 1943. It was the program of qualitative transformation of ideology from totalitarian principles to a democratic platform. Such vital decisions of a philosophical nature always raise fears, doubts and criticisms from a section of the community. The same happened with the OUN, but common sense won the day. The third OUN assembly changed the ideology of Ukrainian nationalists towards a democratic direction. Afterwards, those who remained in their previous leadership posts accused them of having acted incorrectly and that it happened under the influence of communist Dnipro-Ukraine. Yet, in July 1944, a large meeting of the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council was held in the village of Sprina in Lviv region, where 20 delegates arrived. In addition to representatives of Stepan Bandera, former members of the Central Council of Ukraine Kirill Osmak, Vasil Patishko and Vasil Moroz were enlisted into the underground parliament. It included public and political figures from the times of the Ukrainian hetman state of Pavlo Skoropatsky, Yaroslav Bilenki and Varfolomei Yevtimovich, as well as the leaders of the Ukrainian People's Democratic Union, the largest Ukrainian parliamentary force in the interwar Polish Sejm, Vasil Mudry and Zenon Kolensky, doctor of theology Mykola Halyant, who was tortured by the Bolsheviks in 1945, represented Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky, Negotiations were held with Oleg Olzic about delegates from Andrei Melnik's wing of the OUN joining the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council, but the Germans arrested Olzic. The Ukrainian Main Liberation Council was in fact an association whose task was to unite all the forces of the liberation camp to fight for a united, independent Ukrainian state. However, the Council turned into a warring government of a warring country. That is, with the formation of the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council, it acquired a completely new status, transforming Ukraine from an object to a subject of international politics in World War II. Despite the fact that the majority at the Constituent Assembly of the Ukrainian Liberation Council were delegates from the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, headed by Ukrainian insurgent army commander Roman Shukhevich, the former head of the Central Council of Ukraine Kirill Osmak was elected president of the council. The meeting elected Roman Shukhevich chairman of the General Secretariat, the executive body of the Presidium of the Council. He became Secretary General for Military Affairs. This is quite symbolic. So the OUN and the Ukrainian insurgent army, represented by Roman Shukhevich, who at that time was in Ukraine, demonstrated that his army was not a formal body, not a formal position. After all, we all understand that Roman Shukhevich could have had any post in this organization. Therefore, the figure of president of the council, who had to be elected at these large meetings, was also symbolic. It's seemed to unite the whole of Ukraine in this struggle. And the main objective that the Council faced was the struggle for a united Ukrainian independent state on all its ethnic lands. Ukraine had always been in his heart, in his thoughts and his vision, and he was involved in the formation of the Ukrainian Liberation Council. There is a certain symbolism here. First, Kirill Osmak was a resident of Dnipro, Ukraine. Secondly, he was a man who had been subjected to repression three times from the Russian Bolshevik government. Roman Shuhevich was elected head of the government or head of the general secretariat. He was a resident of Western Ukraine. And here was the symbolic unification of Western Ukraine and Dnipro-Ukraine. 
The Great Meeting proclaimed the Council to the Supreme Body of the Ukrainian People in its revolutionary liberation struggle for a united and independent Ukrainian state. It was supposed to coordinate the activities of political centers, manage the liberation struggle and determine the direction of Ukrainian state policy and to represent the Ukrainian people and its struggle for statehood at international level. In addition to the parliament and government of the warring country, the general court and the control board were approved. It's clear that the then Ukrainian government was divided into the legislative, executive and judicial branches. In fact, the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council was no less a legitimate body than, for example, the formation of the Ukrainian People's Republic in 1918. In other words, this was a perfectly normal desire of the people to create their own state, with their own state institutions. Some scholars and historians say that the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council was more legitimate than, for example, the Ukrainian Central Council, the Ukrainian People's Republic. At the time, the Ukrainian Central Council showed that the Ukrainian people were fighting, striving for independence. Ukrainians are active political players on the map of Europe. They want to build their own state and will do so through their own efforts. Once it was created, the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council led the national liberation movement of the Ukrainian people. Thus, the Ukrainian insurgent army became the armed forces of the underground Ukrainian government and parliament. At the Constituent Assembly, Roman Shuhevich argued that the OUN could not claim exclusive rights to the Ukrainian insurgent army. The Ukrainian insurgent army is the armed force not of the organization, but of the entire nation. The task of the Council was to coordinate the liberation movement. That is, under its control and leadership new units were created. Newly formed units swore allegiance to the Ukrainian insurgent army. This body, at the stage of its creation, provided leadership to the liberation struggle on the territory of Ukraine. The second area of work was to represent Ukraine in general European society. We know that several members were left in Ukraine, while others emigrated and were supposed to represent Ukraine there. By the end of 1944, most members of the Council had left for the West to provide diplomatic activity for the Ukrainian movement in the world. They acted within the framework of the foreign representation of the Council together with the OUN's overseas units. In 1944, a section of underground leaders left for the West. When the front was retreating, they took advantage. Part of the leaders of the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council, which was established in July 1944, and a section of representatives of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, who were released from German camps at the end of 1944 and 1945. When they lost Ukraine, they were no longer interested in either Bandera or Melnik. Some were liberated by the Americans. When they captured the camps, they appeared in the British or American occupation zone. And it was clear that they were looking for some kind of contacts with those governments. What did they ask for? Probably financial support to get some couriers over, as they got around by food. And this was a big problem. Communication with foreign units of the Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists and the Council was maintained all the time. Right up until 1954. According to Ukrainian scholars, from the time of creation of the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council, the Ukrainian liberation movement acquired a new quality. It changed the status of Ukraine during World War II from an object to a subject of Eastern European politics. Although none of the countries recognized the authority of this revolutionary state body, to some extent the Council questioned the existence of puppet Soviet power in Ukraine. Also, despite the short existence of the Ukrainian Main Liberation Council, it had shown the continuity of the traditions of Ukrainian statehood, acted as a non-partisan representative body of war in Ukraine.